this. There's something uh, going on here with boy. players and spectators. He's There's a silly a, boy. an argument here. This is silly stuff. We are being physically attacked here. We need to respond. Isn't it disgusting? I think we're all shocked. Both them to keep the vessels. Smashed it to me, a gully, and I dropped it. So the guys weren't very happy with me, I can tell you. Any help uh, at Adelaide for the seamers in the first session? Yeah, well, it's haunted me, much like Hussein's call at Brisbane. 37 runs required for victory. I said, oh, have a go at these idiots. I get our first ball here. So true. I thought we've got them here. How you can make a decision like that? And Vessels off the mark as a try to stunt to the team. Is totally beyond me, and it cost us dearly. It had already been an eventful year by the time Bob Willis and his party of 16 players headed for Sydney. The headlines had been dominated by the dramatic events in the Falklands War, the IRA Hyde Park bombing, and of course the World Cup in Spain, where England failed to make the semi-finals despite not losing a game. The other big sports story had surrounded an unofficial rebel tour to South Africa back in April by what became known as Gooch's Dirty Dozen. The rebels were banned from playing international cricket for three years, which had an immediate effect on the squad that Willis took with him down under. I think Graham Gooch was probably England's best player at that time, uh, just shading David Gower, but at the top of the order with no Gooch and no boycott, uh, we really struggled to find any decent opener. Amongst the squad that was selected was South African-born Alan Lamb. He had qualified and made his debut for England the previous summer, but with the country of his birth so dominant in the sporting headlines, he still didn't feel entirely comfortable in the side. I remember going to Bob and David and Ian when I arrived in Australia and asked to have a meeting with them because there was still that, I had that feeling that I wasn't really accepted by, by the team yet. And I said, listen guys, you know, I'm totally committed. And they all said, listen, you're one of us. Alan was a tremendous character, never gave in, but we probably didn't need his type of off-field behavior to go with the mix of Gower and Botham. So the champagne duo became a trio. I enjoyed their company hugely. And the fun that you have actually produces spirit on the field as well. So it was after a 27-hour flight, England arrived in Australia to play a five-test series and defend the ashes that had been won so dramatically 18 months previously on the back of Ian Botham's heroics. That's it this time. He's made sure he's taken five wickets. He grabs a stump. Then, of course, Brearley had been in charge. Now it was Willis another consequence of the Rebel Tour. Okay. Getting the England captaincy uh, was <laughs> a thunderbolt from the blue, really, um, but there wasn't really um, much choice as captain. They weren't going to go back to Ian. It was too early for David Gower, so uh, the pointer spun round and stuck at me. Bob, you know, what he had to do bowling-wise and captain, it was a lot. But I enjoyed him as a captain. Uh, he came across well. When he was bowling, quite often we changed the field for him while he was wandering back to his, well, oh, we'll just move that bloke there and a bit this here, and then Bobby didn't know. So when Bob came into bowl and someone necked it to third slip, Bob said, well, I thought I had a third slip. Beefy said, you did, but he's done a third man now, you know. So <laughs> it was quite funny in that way. Clearly, it isn't easy uh, to skip her aside when one gets exhausted from bowling late in the day and you've got to not only make decisions for yourself, but other people in the side. A constant theme in the 1980s when it came to English sport was the curse of football hooliganism. Cricket, for the most part, seemed to escape the worst of it, although pitch invasions by spectators at the end of a match often led to players having to sprint for the safety of the dressing room. During the first test of the tour, though, in Perth, that all changed. England had just scored 400, and I went out to the cover position. I'm looking at the scoreboard, and all these the bother boys, or whatever they call them, come onto the field. And one of them ran around behind me and whacked me in the back of the head. 
we're being physically attacked here, we need to respond. That's the way I thought about it. In that split second, I just took off after him. Look at this, there's something uh, going on here with boy. players and spectators. There's silly a, boy. an argument here, this is silly stuff. The footage shows that I moved pretty quickly, at the, you know, probably fast as I've ever moved. He fell over and I put my arm out and, of course, just popped my shoulder. All hell broke loose. Lily there coming into eight, Alderman. Border very close at hand. I think that gentleman's got to more than he can handle at the moment. Carted off on a stretcher and uh, put in the ambulance and they hadn't got it back into... It was still out by the time I got to uh, the hospital, Royal Perth Hospital. This is a policeman on the ground. Well, well, isn't it disgusting? I think we were all shocked and I could understand Greg taking the, uh, the players off and I think we'd have done the same. I have to say, I think a lot of the, a lot of the problems were with the England supporters, but they weren't cricket supporters. They were basically England football fans and uh, a large proportion came to the cricket to, just to cause trouble. Randall drives, beautiful shot. Thanks to 115 from the irrepressible Derek Randall, England drew the first test comfortably and headed for the second test in Brisbane in confident mood. Fine shot. Straight drive. It was a confidence that was misplaced as Australia won by seven wickets, chiefly because of a maiden test century on debut by another player with South African origins, Kepler Vessels. I played with him at Western Province and, um, and you know, he was a stubborn batter, not very good to watch. In our team meeting, I said, we'll get him out in the gully area, definitely, because if you bowl a little bit wide, that's where we'll get him. Kepler had this habit of sort of squaring up a little bit and then punching it through the offside. Now, he can get a lot of runs through there, but he, early on, you always might have a chance in the gully. So I did my part. Both them to Kepler Vessels. Smashed it to me at, at Gully and I dropped him on three or four. He went on to get 160, so the guys weren't very happy with me, I can tell you. I looked at him and um, I said, uh, nearly a very good plan. There it is. Shaw pulls it forward a square. Well played, couple of vessel. A tremendous innings and a tremendous pressure. 160 odd runs. As Willis put Australia in on a flat Adelaide pitch and soon lived to regret it. I think it's basically uh, a pretty good wicket. I think any help uh, at Adelaide for the seamers is in the first session. So I hope we can make use of it. Well, that's a good shot. Dropped short and hooked away down to the boundary by Vessels. Yeah, well, it's haunted me, much like Hussein's call at Brisbane. But my think tank of middle order batsmen, Botham and uh, Lamb and Gower donned their green tinted spectacles and insisted that we bowled first if I won the toss. So I took the rap for it, but it was their decision as much as mine, and uh, a very poor one it was. Fine shot. Was captaincy done by committee in those days? I wasn't as forceful as I should have been, but uh, they were a difficult uh, trio to. Uh, uh, tell them what to do. Oh, he smashed that. The man who made England really pay for the mistake was Greg Chappell with his eighth and what would turn out to be his last hundred in the ashes. There it is, Greg Chappell's first ever test century at the Adelaide Oval. He'd missed the 81 tour but was now back in charge. The Lillies and the Thompsons and those guys weren't uh, that keen on, on you being captain. So bringing Greg Chappell back was the right thing. Well, I think Greg Chappell in any team makes a difference. Fantastic player, fantastic batsman, and to have him back in the side gave, uh, gave the side a, a settling influence. He was important. If Australia were buoyed by having Chapel back in charge, England were regretting the lack of impact that the star of 1981, Ian Botham, was having. Well, that's a good shot. Indeed, this was to prove his least successful Ashes tour, with just 150 and no five-wicket hauls. And while it is true he was the joint leading wicket-taker with 18, those wickets came at a cost of 40 each. I think after 81, Ian uh, probably thought that he was invincible. Probably didn't have to uh, prepare himself properly 
for test matches and look after himself. Look, you're not going to do it every day of the week. And it was physically and uh, mentally, it was quite tiring, that 81 series. Everyone thinks about the glamour. But there's also another side to it. And it was quite tiring. And 82-3, uh, you almost got there. And I thought, oh, it's like sitting in a deck chair now. And just chill out a bit. You were captain. Why didn't you take him to one side and say, get it together? Well, uh, I can remember in the physio's room at uh, the Gabba, the manager, Doug Ensole, and I did take Ian aside and have that conversation with him. His reply, of course, was, uh, don't worry, when it matters, turn the tap on, and it always the water is boiling hot. It was rather tepid for the rest of the tour. Well, fully fit or not, when his country really needed him in the fourth test of the series, England's superstar did not disappoint. The game was played in Melbourne over there at the MCG, and it was tight from the start. The highest score was 294, the lowest 284. But ultimately, it all came down to a last wicket partnership. A very straight bowling there, and Rodney Hogg is on his way. Chasing 292 to win, Australia seemed out of it when Cowens took his sixth wicket of the Australian second innings. And Jeff Thompson, Australia's number 11, wandered out to join Alan Border. 74 to win, a day and a bit to get them. The guys were actually drinking in the dressing room when I went out, like they thought I'd be back in five minutes. I'm thinking, survive, survive, survive till stumps. We're in Melbourne, you don't know what the weather's going to be like here, you know, we might uh, get away with it. By stumps on day four, Australia were halfway there. Border was not out on 44 and Thompson on eight. And with 37 needed, the next morning it seemed that all of Melbourne turned out to watch. We were warming up and watching the people come into the MCG. It was amazing. We were thinking, they're bloody crazy, these people. 37 months required for victory. There would have been 12, 15,000 people somewhere. And I said, oh, AB, have a go at these idiots. I get our first ball here. Bob Willis just hoping that they can get enough deliveries of Jeff Thompson early this morning. The guys come back that morning, that last morning, we still had 30 odd to get, and Marshy said, resume your positions. The Australian thing was that if all of a sudden there was a bit of a partnership, you'd have to sit in the same spot. So we got back to the morning, none of us warmed up at all because we know what Tomo's like. Tomo's going to slog one and he'll get out. They're drinking, they're on the booze, right? Exactly what they were doing that night before. <laughs> so here they are. Damn, well, 11 o'clock start in the morning, they're drinking, but AV and I go out there doing our best for our country. As Tomo and I go out to bat, we're thinking, well, who knows, you know, we got 30-odd yesterday, Who's, why can't we get another 30-odd today? So we're thinking a little bit more positively. Border was very adept at farming the strike. When the field came in, he hit boundaries through the infield, and then Jeff Thompson gave a pretty good impression of Donald Bradman at the other end. Bob Willis to Thompson. Once again, Thompson giving himself room. All of a sudden, it got to 30, it got to 20. Slow but surely, we inched our way. No, I'm still not bowling, haven't been given the ball. Still at slip, and I'm thinking, Bob knows I'm still here, does he? He doesn't think I'm not on the field. He's got it true. I thought, oh, hello, you know, I can't believe it. We've got down under 10. I thought, you know, we've, we've got them here. Nine for 286. To win. I was getting really worried. So the ball is going to look for two here. And then that last over when Bath said, give me the ball. You know, to Bob, give me that ball. Change at the outer end is going to be Ian Botham. He's done it before for England in this situation. Probably reckons he can do it again. If you needed a rabbit out the hat, the magician you needed was uh, I.T. Botham. Eventually, I'd been walking around giving it this past Bob and sort of inferring I'm ready to bowl, and he threw me the ball. I said, well, thanks. Give, you give me a lot to work with here, Bob. Thanks, mate. Botham, long hop outside off stump. Tomo's previously thrown the bat at these and got away with it. Have to go down as a chance. He, he sort of just dabbles it and uh, flies to um, Chris Tavray, wasn't it? It slipped. And he went like that to catch it there, and it burst through, and it, I think it just clipped his head. <laughs> He's done him! Second time, Tavray left it up, and it was taken by Miller. Thompson was gone. If it had been there, it had gone straight through, four would have lost. So the, the actual game was won or lost by the difference of that and that. England win by three runs. We all just ran 
was incredible. I mean, I, that's the closest test match I've ever played in. And we did celebrate that win in some style. So near for Australia. Oh, mate, I was just distraught. When I got out, I went in the dressing room. I sat down in the seat. You could hear a pin drop. Nobody was going to say a thing. I was shattered. I had a tear in my eye. Then I got angry. <laughs> I've never done this before in my life. I got up, walked into their dressing room. Beefy and that got up, oh, have a beer. I said, shut up. I said, that's the worst thing you could ever do. I'm going to kill the lot of you next week. Everybody was just gobsmacked. Now, even my own blokes, because I, I just don't do that. I have a beer with that. If I walk back into the dressing room, I thought, you goose. <laughs> With the series back at 2-1, England went to Sydney for the last test, knowing another win would mean that the Ashes were retained. Well, it was a long shot, but certainly we thought we had a chance. We uh, discovered we were capable of beating this very good Australian side. The first over of the day now, Bob Willis is the bowler. He's coming into bowl to Kepler Vessels, no runs on the board. But uh, things weren't helped when um, Mel Johnson, the square leg umpire, uh, gave John Dyson not out when he was run out by six feet. And Vessels off the mark as it's right to stumps and that's out. Oh, yeah. oh, it was close, my goodness. Well, look, Bob doesn't have moments like that very often in the field. What a magnificent bit of fielding there by Bob Willis. That's going to be very interesting to have a look at. To swoop, pick it up one-handed, swivel and hit the stumps is a once-in-a-career moment. It was ridiculous. I mean, the stumps went flying out the ground. Uh, he was nowhere near. This is how bad it was. The papers the next morning showed it. And you can see this ball hit in the stumps, and Dyson and his bat aren't even in the picture. They're not in the frame. Oh, dear. You can make up your own mind from that picture. How you can make a decision like that uh, is totally beyond me. Dyson, I feel sure, would have thought that uh, that was that. Actually, no, I didn't think I was out. I thought I'd just made it. With the benefit of slow motion TV, it showed that I was actually short of the crease. But in real time, I couldn't tell. I thought I was in. The following morning, we went round to Mel Johnson and we chucked the paper to him and said, good decision yesterday. Oh! Australian umpiring in those days was unbelievably biased. But we got used to it by then. You've got to remember that in 1970-71, we played six completed test matches in Australia and didn't get one LBW. We weren't expecting very much from their umpires. He gets his 50s, he plays it backwards, so well played John Dyson. Dyson went on to make an invaluable 79, and when Kim Hughes hit 137 in the Australian second innings, making sure they couldn't lose, the Ashes were back in Australian hands. One of the guys had gone out to get a little urn, a little replica. We named him Ernie, and we all got our photos with Ernie and all that sort of thing, you know, so it was fantastic. It was a great way to end what was my last battle against the English. We all felt absolutely wrapped that we could regain the Ashes. We didn't have a very uh, strong team. We were a world-class bowler light and probably two world-class batsmen light because of the South African tour. And uh, we didn't deserve to win the series. Uh, Australia were better than us, as simple as that. With the Test Series over, the two sides were now joined by New Zealand for the traditional one-day tournament, the World Series. England were again disappointing, winning only four of their ten games, so they missed out on the best of three finals. There was, though, one moment which lifted the gloom, and it came in Brisbane. It was one of the most hilarious things uh, I've ever seen. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Hilarious. Hilarious. How did somebody get that into the ground? Well, it was uh, fantastic, really. Uh, uh, some medical students had anaesthetised a piglet. The idea was at lunchtime to release the pig onto the ground. They gave it a bit too much, and it didn't wake up at lunchtime. It was still in the, you know, in the bottom of the esky. And when the poor piglet came round, he was let loose on the outfield with Botham written on one side and Eddie written on the other side. Eddie wasn't impressed. Oh, he wouldn't be. No, he wouldn't be. <laughs> Everybody else was. <laughs> I've seen some very funny and very strange things, but how they got away with it was beyond me. Australian humour, brilliant. 
Botham, to me, was a rock star. And I said, you've got to look like a rock star. 100 to Alan Border. I probably got on better with the England boys than my own team. England have won the Test match. To lead an England side to an Ashes victory is nirvana. You treasure that forever.